Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going in our Bible this morning. Long, long ago, and I was thinking as they sang that, uh, how that the Bible says uh, uh, a thousand years is as one day with the Lord. Now, wouldn't you like to have that kind of mind? Uh, I can't remember what happened 15 minutes ago. But to the, look, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for our sin is as fresh on the mind of God as if it happened yesterday. Ain't that something? That's a blessed, uh, that's a blessed thought to us. That it never grows old with him, and I trust it'll never grow old with us, what Jesus has done for us in salvation. Philippians chapter number 3 this morning, and, and it's good to see Micah back with us, amen. And I asked him how he enjoyed Okinawa. He said it was good, but we spent most of our time somewhere else. So <laughs> that's the way it goes with the military. But I know he's glad to be back. I know the family's glad as well. And so we're rejoicing in the Lord bringing him home safely and in time for the holidays. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Philippians chapter number 3, and we want to go here to verse number uh, 1, just to kind of bring our mind up to speed where we have been discussing uh, Paul's obvious uh, warnings, if you will, to these believers at Philippi, uh, and a couple of thoughts we'd like to finish, uh, Lord willing, on this passage uh, uh, this, uh, this morning and tonight as the Lord leads. But in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To, re uh, to write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God uh, in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ, uh, excuse me, and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the time in your word and for the time of worship. Now, as we open the word of God, we pray that you'd help our hearts and minds to be sensitive uh, to your word. Spirit of God, help me to speak clearly uh, that which you design for this time. And Lord, we pray that your will will be accomplished. We rejoice uh, in uh, the word of God and ask for its guidance today. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, of course, because of his love for these believers, we said, uh, had uh, been very careful uh, to help warn them uh, about uh, certain things in their life. And uh, when, we, we, when we began looking at these verses, I was thinking about all that's going on uh, with this pandemic. I was thinking about uh, how that, uh, you, you know, it seemed like the, obviously there was the uh, alleviating of some of these restrictions, then things are clamped back down, seemed like you, you know, you're making a, a one step forward and then two steps back, and, uh, and then the, the, the burden and the challenge of trying to maintain kind of whatever forward progress we can make uh, at a time like that. Uh, and, and then trying to, to be committed to that progress, if we could, uh, even in the midst of the burden. And that's, that's, that's true, uh, not only, uh, of course, with the, the ministry of the church, uh, but it's also true in personal life as well. Uh, and it's very easy, of course, and has been very easy, it appears, for the devil at a time like this to get into people's minds and hearts and to pull them down and, and, and discourage and wear out and, um, uh, and confuse. Uh, there are so many, uh, so many uh, ill effects of what is taking place, taking place over these last many months uh, in the hearts and minds of, uh, of our globe, really. Uh, but uh, the focus uh, here has been for that of the saints. And uh, I mentioned on Wednesday night that because that we have been saved and we have the Spirit of God within us, and the Lord tells us to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, that really, when you think about it, because of the Word of God and because of the presence of the Spirit, believers are built for times like this. We are equipped for times like this. Uh, we have purpose in times like this. And we have to be careful that we don't lose sight of that. 
because it would be and has been very easy for some to do that. Uh, and so that, would be the, that was also the case uh, with uh, these believers in Philippi where uh, Paul is beginning to write to them uh, and to warn them because of uh, his love for them. It, it's, it's very picturesque uh, of the burden of a, of a parent toward a child. And I, I know that, uh, you know, nobody likes to be considered childish, do they? Uh, and uh, except for the ones that don't know any better, uh, we want to we wanna have at least some kind of mindset that we're grown up and mature and, um, and we kind of have a, a, a realization of the presence of God and, you know, some semblance of biblical knowledge to be able to take the right steps when things don't uh, look so, uh, so good. And, uh, but, but Paul writes to these believers in a sense as, as a picture of a parent, but more uh, as a spiritual authority in their life and warning them of possible footholds and failures if they're not paying attention to what's going on around them and in them. The Bible tells us that we're to walk circumspectly. That means be aware of what's going on. And um, uh, the, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the many but primary failures of many people's spiritual walk is the just not paying attention, uh, not being aware of the environment that, uh, that they're in. And that's what Paul warns them about here. Uh, several things uh, that we started with. The first thing he warned them about was uh, being cautious about getting discouraged because uh, our eyes uh, get taken off of the Lord Jesus Christ as our focus. The scripture says that we're to live our life looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so the Bible reminds us in Philippians 3 and verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. No matter what's going on in our life, rejoice in the Lord. The Lord, and there's lots that we can rejoice in, especially as we mentioned already at this uh, Christmas season. We rejoice in the fact that God sent His Son uh, to be the Savior of all mankind. Uh, we can we can think about our salvation in Him. We can think about the wisdom that we have in Him. We can think about the the uh, provision that we have in Jesus Christ. We can think about the fellowship that we have in Jesus Christ. That 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 where the Lord has said, "I will never leave thee nor forsake thee." Rejoice in uh, the Lord. And so beware of allowing the distraction of other things to take your eyes off the Lord. Then we said that he warned them uh, against uh, allowing ourselves to become uh, uninterested in the things of God. Now, it's possible for even believers to get bored with spiritual things. That happens again when we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. It also happens because we have a very light view of sin. We have a very light view of what it cost Jesus on Calvary uh, to, to, to provide for us forgiveness in Christ. Well, we just don't understand how sin offends the mind of a holy God. And so we take lightly then forgiveness. We take lightly sometimes. We take for granted our salvation. We take for granted the Bible. We take for granted the fellowship of the saints. And, uh, and when we begin to do that, we become disinterested in spiritual things. Uh, and uh, that leads to this, to this uh, third warning that we started uh, when we finished last time. And that was that Paul warned them about being consumed by certain dangerous uh, aspects of life. Beware of being consumed. The Bible says uh, in 1 Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is trying to swallow you up. He, he's, tr he's trying to He's trying, to, if he can, to, uh, to, to, to cause you to doubt God, just like he did in, uh, in the Garden of Eden when he tempted Adam and Eve and said, Yea, half God said. And so he's trying to wear you out. He may not be able to have your soul because you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but if he can get in there and ruin your thinking and cause you to get off direction, you're like, he can mess up uh, not only your life, but he can mess up those around you. That's what he's seeking to do. He is a vicious enemy. Listen, 
Forget, Al- forget ISIS. Forget Al-Qaeda. They don't hold a candle to the wickedness of the devil. He has no concern for you. He has no concern for your children. Uh, uh, he, has, he has no concern for anything but the ruining of the testimony of Jesus Christ in this world. And if he can do that through you, he most certainly will. Beware about allowing him to consume certain aspects of your life. And one of those, uh, one of those aspects we talked about is mentioned in chapter 3 and verse 2. Beware of dogs. Now, again, we said he's not talking there about animals. Of course, you need to beware. But uh, he's talking about the unsaved. He, the Bible says without are dogs. It's a reference to those who do not know Christ as Savior. So here's the thing. He is warning believers not to allow themselves to be consumed with the things of an ungodly world. Don't allow yourself to be tempted and drawn away and, uh, and distracted in that way because we said the Bible's clear that, uh, that the world is not interested in the holy things of God. The world is not interested as a whole in turning from their sin. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That describes our world. The world doesn't care about the church. The world doesn't care about the testimony of Christ. It doesn't care about the Bible. And ultimately, the world doesn't even really care about you. The world is in a... uh, The world, is the philosophy and the mindset of it uh, is sin and self. Beware. Don't allow yourself to be consumed by dirty dogs, he said. Don't allow yourself to be consumed. Beware of evil workers. We quoted to you there for, to 2 Timothy 3 and 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. For such are false apostles. They profess they know God and such the like. Evil workers. Wouldn't it be good if every, if every individual that claimed to know the Lord was motivated by the philosophies of the Lord? Wouldn't that be good? But the fact of the matter is it's just not. And we better be careful lest we be drawn into uh, the uh, and controlled by, consumed with the work of evil. Or beware. What did he say? Rejoice in the Lord. You know, the Lord had to deal with this all the time, didn't he? <laughs> Every time he went to the temple or the, or the synagogue, there was somebody there trying to find fault. There was somebody there trying to trip him up. There was somebody there that was trying to falsely accuse him. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he had to be careful about how he walked. But the Bible was clear that he didn't let it hinder his work for the Lord. He wanted to keep going, for, going forward for the God of heaven. So we have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be consumed by the world. We have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be consumed by the thoughts and actions of evil workers. And then we said the third thing that Paul warned about here uh, is also in verse number 2 in the last part of the word, uh, verse. Beware of the concision. Beware of the concision. Now, these were the Judaizers. They were the ones that wanted to bring these people who had been saved by grace through faith back underneath the requirements of the law in order to either complete their, or to be saved in the first place, or to complete their salvation, or to be spiritual. And they were, uh, in effect then, false teachers. Now, you'll notice two words here, uh, which are, you know, one is the form of the other. He says, beware of the concision. And then in the first part of verse 3, he says, for we are the circumcision. And so he begins to talk about the difference here between the false teachers and false religion uh, and genuine believers and true religion. Now, the, 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 the closer we get to the rapture of the church... There has been and will continue to be an explosion of false teaching in this world. Because the, 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 the more things draw nigh unto the end, the more effort's going to be put to by the devil uh, to, uh, to have as many as he can condemned before God. False teachers are, are all across this land. 
We're not talking about, of course, just in foreign countries, but in America itself. Even that which professes to be religious and that which professes to be biblical, we need to try everything by the truth of God's Word unless we get, draw, unless we get drawn into and consumed by false teaching. False teaching. And I'm convinced the more, uh, the more we see going on and the more we study God's Word, the more of God's Word we need to help and to protect us in this life. To help preach the true salvation that is in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you one of the things, just by way of example before we move on, that one of the great points of false teaching in our day is a salvation without repentance. A salvation message without repentance. And, uh, and grace, uh, the, the doctrine of grace, the marvelous, wonderful doctrine of grace has been pushed to the point of being lasciviousness and license. The idea, just come to Jesus as you are, which is true, we all have to do that. No, nobody can... Nobody can straighten themselves up before they get saved. Nobody can make their life right without the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life to help understand spiritual things. Nobody can do that. But the fact of the matter is, you might come to Jesus as you are, but after you've met Him, you will not be as you were. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And we're seeing in our day this preaching of the gospel, uh, in a sense, uh, that is a salvation without biblical repentance. That is the willingness to understand the true depth of our sin, our absolute depravity. Did you know, nobody can really come to Christ even saying, well, I'm a pretty good person. There's none good. No, not one. Not one. Without the presence of the Spirit of God and, friends, and salvation forgiveness in Christ, uh, we're as dark as dark can be. As wicked as wicked can be. And so we need to be careful uh, just by that example. Beware of being uh, taken in by uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, defilement of the world around us. Beware of being taken in by uh, evil workers. Beware of being taken in by false teaching. And that's going to increase more and more. Evil men, the Bible says, and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Brethren, we are living in that day. Then Paul moves in the passage uh, to the point of the message this morning, and that is to beware of being consumed by personal pride. Beware of being consumed by personal pride. And you begin to see that as we read. Uh, let's, let's read verse 3 uh, to uh, move us into verse 4. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, verse 4, though I, might have conf though, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in Christ, I more. And from that point, he begins to talk about, if I wanted to trust in the flesh, if I wanted to trust in myself, if I wanted to, uh, to be consumed with all that I uh, have apprehended in this world with regard to religion and religiosity, if I wanted to trust my own goodness, he said, I could. And uh, he talks about several aspects of that, uh, illustrating that in which many are trusting uh, and the fallacy in which many are trusting even in our day, not only for their salvation but for their spirituality. And he mentioned several aspects of pride, roots of pride in our life. The first thing that he mentions here in verse 5 is nationality. Look at verse 5, he says, Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of what? Israel, nationality, nationality. Uh, we hear a lot about national pride, don't we? And I'm thankful for America. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I, I, you know, I was saved because of the preaching of the gospel uh, from a missionary that was sent from the United States of America. I praise the Lord for that. But there is no saving power or really spiritual uh, 
benefit, if you will, of having been born American. You say, well, I don't know about that. Look here. Uh, Jesus wasn't born an American. We didn't get the Bible from America, did we? Matter of fact, the Bible says that with regard, he, matter of fact, when Paul was preaching about the sin of the Jews, he said that God had committed unto them the lively oracles of God. They had been committed to the word of God. And sometimes I think that um, nationality is a source of pride for people that, force, that, that causes them, doesn't force them, but it causes them to have an undue sense of their own superiority. Paul said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Look, uh, being, uh, being born American or any other nationality does not guarantee God's favor in the least and certainly doesn't guarantee salvation in and of itself. The second thing that Paul mentions here is not just nationality, but then also ancestry. He said he was circumcised this, uh, the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. Ancestry. Well, now look here. You don't understand who my family is. You ever heard somebody say that? People put a lot of pride in that type of ancestry. Benjamin was a prominent family. The first king of Israel came from Benjamin. They were a prominent family uh, in the nation of Israel, but the Bible warns against such ancestral faith and confidence by reminding us in Psalm 51 and verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. It doesn't matter what family you were born into. The Bible says ultimately we were all born into sin. And that there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says of John the Baptist in Matthew 3 and verse 8, when the Pharisees came out to, uh, to uh, challenge, uh, to, to uh, resist, uh, uh, or at least to give the appearance of uh, at least uh, being interested in or uniting with what he was preaching, he said in Matthew 3 and 8, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Ain't that, can you imagine what an offense that would have been to them because of personal pride? When he said, look, I, you, look you might have come from Abraham, but the fact of the matter is God can make children Abraham from these rocks. Wow. What was the purpose of that? Just to be nasty? No, it was to help people to realize that, that, that there is no uh, proper cause for personal pride in any aspect of human existence when it comes to, uh, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, you know, my history, somebody will say, well, you know, you talk, some, some people you talk to them about salvation and believing on the Lord, and they'll say, well, now look here, my family, I, my family and my ancestry has always been... And that reminds me of a couple I spoke to in Japan. And uh, they had visited the services, and we went to go follow up with them and, and sat down to talk to them. And I uh, started to ask them about their belief in Christ and their knowledge of the Lord. And the lady stopped me. And she said, now look here. She said, I just want you to know that I am very, very Catholic. And I said, well, ma'am, I'm very, very Baptist. But could we just put that aside for a minute and look at the Bible? Look what the Bible says. And uh, I asked him, her and her husband, I think he was from a Lutheran background. But um, I, asked, uh, I asked him, I said, if I could show you from the Bible, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Lutheran, whatever, if I could show you from the Bible what God says about salvation, would you believe it? And she said, well, sure. So I showed them the gospel, and both of them said, we've never done that. Could we get saved? And they both repented of their sin, trust Christ their Savior. And, and, and immediately she said, oh, she went to crying, went to tears. I said, what's the matter? She said, well, I'm concerned. I'm concerned now how my family's going to respond to my decision to be a Christian. 
And I said, ma'am, listen, I understand the burden. I understand the challenge, but if you could just do this, if you could just remember when you die and pass from this life, you're not going to be standing before your mother. You're not going to be standing before your father. You're not going to be standing to give answer before your priest or any other thing. You're going to stand before the Lord of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. And your responsibility at that moment will have been uh, to respond in, in faith to the truth of God's word. We need to be careful about the personal pride sometimes that comes up in us because of our nationality and the personal pride that comes up in us because of our ancestry. But then the third thing Paul mentions here, uh, he warns against becoming uh, uh, consumed by the personal pride that comes sometimes as a result of our orthodoxy. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, here it is, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee. Now there are two groups in the New Testament primarily that caused the Lord the most problem. The, the, um, uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were the, were the, liberal, the liberal side, if you will, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the religious system. They denied such things as the resurrection of the dead and other things. But the Pharisees were the orthodox side. They, by their life, they had a respect for the scriptures. They had a respect as they, as they knew it for God and his law. Paul said with regard to himself that he was a Pharisee. Matter of fact, in one particular occasion, after, of course, he was saved... And uh, he finds himself in a situation where they're about to tear him apart uh, because of his preaching. And he realized that part of them were Sadducees and part of them were Pharisees. Paul said, I believe in the resurrection from the dead. And in that moment, he split the crowd and then they couldn't decide what to do with him. All of a sudden, the ones that wanted to kill him uh, from the Pharisee side were like, hey, we like this guy. Because he believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. But Paul said, you know, it, it, it's not our orthodoxy. It's not our orthodoxy that saves us. You know, there are a lot of people that believe biblical statements about Christ that have never trusted him. They can quote scripture, they know, but they don't know the Lord. So Paul said, I was a Pharisee. He said in Acts 22 and 3, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, who was, a, who was the top teacher of the day, if you will, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law and the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. I had all the right teaching. But there was no right relationship. And the truth of the matter is that, that somebody can, can graduate from the best schools under the best teachers and still die without Jesus Christ. In Matthew 23 and 23, the Lord said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin or cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. In other words, you know all the aspects. You know the jot and the tittle, but you don't know the Lord of the Word. Be careful about letting orthodoxy. Now listen. If there's any place where that caution needs to be preached, it's in fundamental Bible-believing churches. Because young people come up in those churches knowing the right things. But many of them never establish a personal relationship with Christ by repentance and faith. There's a difference in knowing and believing and trusting. And so Paul said, be careful. He said, I, I don't want to allow myself to get caught up into personal pride of orthodoxy. 
But then he goes one step further and says, I don't want to allow myself to get caught up uh, as some kind of a belief in myself because of spiritual activity. Verse 6, he says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He believed so much in what he believed, if you will, that, uh, he, you know the story of Saul, the great persecutor of the early church? He committed men and women to prison and uh, he stood in approval at their uh, executions. He was a religiously zealous and active man. I mean, he, he didn't just believe what he believed. He was putting into action what he believed. Remember, he went and obtained letters from the elders and the authorities to go and to persecute the church in other places. He was active, if you will, in his religion, but it didn't mean he was saved, and he knew it, he knew it didn't mean he was saved. And uh, yet again, the Bible reminds us that uh, activity in the end uh, is not a genuine, deep indicator of true saving faith. There are a lot of people that are active religiously that are lost. There, listen, uh, what's further? There are a lot of people that are active religiously that are not spiritual. And that's the one I uh, would uh, presume that should speak to most of us this morning. To be careful about doing the work of the Lord in the strength of our own mind, in the strength of the flesh. Because we can be act just like, you know, the Martha and Mary. Martha was cumbered. Mary's worshiping Jesus. Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, a picture of worship, uh, and uh, Jesus said she's chosen the good part, and it's not going to be taken from her. Brethren, uh, much religious activity is not ultimately a true indicator of salvation or spirituality. It can certainly be so in our life as well. So Paul said, "Look, I know my history." I know my background. I know, uh, uh, you know, how I came up. But we need to be careful about allowing to control our lives, uh, personal pride and our nationality and our ancestry and our orthodoxy in our activity. And then he mentions another in the last part of verse number six, and that is our morality. Chapter six, excuse me, chapter six, chapter three and verse six. Look, the last part of the verse. Touching the righteousness which is in the law. What's that word? Blameless. Paul was a very moral man. But brethren, he was a lost man. Many would have confused his morality for spirituality. But that's not always the case. And that's why we're warned against it. He said blameless here, of course, not sinless. And what that means is that when Paul violated any part of the law, he was careful to bring the required sacrifice for that particular sin. He was a stickler to obeying all the rules. Yet morality in the end alone ensures no one of heaven. Let's go back and look at it in Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3 and verse 10. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. And here you find the state of our morality in truth. Romans 3 and 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Uh, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. 
Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And you know many times people will say that they believe that they're going to heaven when they die because of their morality, and their morality is because they obey the Ten Commandments. I don't know. I've heard that myself. The Bible says nobody's obeyed the Ten Commandments. Matter of fact, the Ten Commandments, uh, in a sense, weren't even given to be obeyed. They were, be, they were given to demonstrate how sinful we are, how disobedient we are, how incompliant we are. How rebellious we are uh, in, the, in the depths of our heart because of our depraved nature. And so for all of these things, uh, they brought profit or glory to Paul before men, but they did not bring him salvation in Christ. You know, the Bible speaks of the Pharisees that said they love to wear long garments and stand in the marketplace and sit in the chiefest seats and, and pray out loud and sound a trumpet before they prayed, before they gave. And it, it got them a long way in the eyes of the people. But the Lord said they were whited sepulchers. Everything appeared to be clean and right on the outside, but on the inside, they were full of dead men's bones. Uh, you know, uh, none, of these, none of these points of personal pride do anything to commend us to God. The only reason that we are commended to God is because of personal repentance of our sin and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't help Paul a bit, and so we move from Paul talking about his earthly prophet and the pride that it, that it caused in him, to his heavenly loss. From his earthly prophet to his heavenly loss. In verse 7, the Bible says, here, here it is, after all that list of, of, uh, uh, of goodness, at least in the eyes of, the, of men, Paul said in verse 7, but, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. His heavenly loss. When he finally lost all of that worldly pride, he gained heaven. Not because of the things that he got rid of himself, but because when he turned from all of that, he turned to Jesus Christ and him alone as Savior. Paul said in Romans 10 and 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ, he said, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Somebody, I, I, I've heard people say, I, I've read it said, in, in an attempt to accuse God, that God started one way in the Old Testament, changed his mind in the New. Nothing could be further from the truth. God did not turn from the Old Testament law. He fulfilled it in Jesus Christ. He fulfilled it. And that's what Paul had to write. That Christ is the end of the law. What was the law? It was burden and uh, it was heaviness. And it was always a reminder of how imperfect and sinful I am. But in Jesus Christ, all of that burden comes to an end. Because he fulfilled that law on our behalf. And you know there's an aspect of this. We're not only in salvation, but also in our Christian life. We begin to focus on all that we do or don't do. Uh, and our, our walk with the Lord and our service to the Lord becomes this heavy burden of a realization of constant failure. 
because we're trying to do in the work of the flesh what God intended to be done in the power of the Spirit. So that our relationship with the Lord is our joy. Rejoice in the Lord. Not falling into the, 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 the trap of our personal pride and again, all that we do or that we don't do. Thinking that that in and of itself is what makes us spiritual. That which was everything to Paul suddenly meant nothing to him. Look at verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Look, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. <laughs> Somebody, oh, well, it's, if you read that verse and you don't finish the verse, you think Paul's complaining about all that he's given up for Christ. I've suffered the loss of all things. But, but notice what he counted it. Dumb. It's not as if he said, oh, I'm sorry I gave all that. It's been so hard for me to give up all this and to be all I can be. All that he was trying to do before, he counted it as manure. I lost it. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost if, uh, uh, you know, uh, some people have things that are precious to them that end up becoming burdens and bondage to them and eventually it gets lost and they're, they're like, oh, I'm glad that's gone. That's what Paul was saying here. <laughs> I'm glad I lost it. I I'm glad it's gone because in the loss of all of that earthly pride, I found Christ. And so... Yeah, he says there, I have suffered the loss of all things, all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And so Paul realized that it's not in everything that he was, it, it was not in everything about his person, his history, his salvation, and his security, and his joy was in his relationship, a growing relationship, mind you, with Jesus Christ. Faith, was the, uh, he, he learned, is the only way to know God. In verse 10, he said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain under the resurrection of the dead. He's talking there about, now isn't that interesting because he said, I'm a Pharisee. I believe in the resurrection. I'm talking about the resurrection of the just. But here's the point. At that time, before he knew the Lord, he would not have, ex have experienced the resurrection of the just because he was a religious, moral, proud, lost man. He had to lose all of that before he could find truth in Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Faith is the only way to know God and obtain salvation. That's true in salvation, but it's also true in spirituality and service. The Bible says in John 12 and 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You know what needs to happen in the lives of a lot of God's children today? They need to die to themselves. They need to die to their pride. They need to die to their history. And they need to live unto Christ. Only then is there true fruitfulness. In Luke 14, 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. There are, brethren, some heavenly losses. And we need to pray that God will help us lose everything that's a hindrance, not only to salvation, but also to spirituality and service. So that we might know him and the power of his resurrection. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer.